It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 159, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. At Beach Grove Farm, Ann and Eric Nordell manage six and a half acres for vegetable crop production, with half of that in cover crop and half of it in vegetables. And they do it with horsepower, next to no hand weeding, and absolutely no irrigation. Ann and Eric share their experience farming with horses, something they've done since Beach Grove Farm's start 35 years ago, and how they set the farm up from the start to be manageable for the two of them. We talk about their strategy for reducing weed pressure, including their reduced tillage system, and the year-on, year-off rotation of vegetables and cover crops that allows them to build soil while minimizing weed issues. We also dig deep into their low-input system for making compost, their low-input wood-fired greenhouse, and the changes they've seen in their rural community. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is generously supported by Vermont Compost Company, founded by organic crop-growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high-quality compost and compost-based living soil mixes for certified organic plant production. VermontCompost.com And by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are versatile, maneuverable in tight spaces, lightweight for less compaction, and easy to maintain and repair on the farm. You're driven and built to last for decades of dependable service, bcsamerica.com. And by High Mowing Organic Seeds, the first independently owned farm-based seed company proudly serving professional organic growers with a full line of 100% certified organic and non-GMO project verified vegetable, herb, flower, and cover crop seeds. Highmowingseeds.com slash farmer to farmer. Anne and Eric Nordell, welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Thanks for having us. Yeah, it's wonderful to be on the Farmer to Farmer podcast. I will say, I, I didn't tell you guys this before, but in episode 100 of the show, my friend Liz Graznak actually interviewed me and she asked what, who were some of the guests that I was particularly excited about having? You know, what was my bucket list for guests to have on the show? And I actually had listed you guys as, as being on that bucket list because I think you guys, I mean, the work that you guys have done with the whole shallow tillage and, and the weed control and the crop rotations, I feel like in many ways it's, it's foundational to stuff that the market farming community is doing. And then, and then there is this added aspect that you guys don't have a computer. So that makes it kind of cool that we're actually doing a podcast recording. <laughs> I'd like to start off by having you guys tell us a little bit about Beach Grove Farm. Where are you guys located? How many vegetables are you guys growing? Where are you guys selling that? We're located in uh, the mountains of north central Pennsylvania. Um, we've been here for about 35, 36 years. We, we manage about six and a half acres uh, for vegetables. Half of that is in cover crops every year. And so it's about three and a half acres, three and a quarter acres uh, for vegetables. And we market everything within a 25 mile radius. Um, we do a farmer's market in Williamsport, which is the closest city. And uh, we supply a few restaurants. I might just add that uh, often when people think of Pennsylvania, what comes to mind is Lancaster County, southeastern Pennsylvania, which is one of the most productive areas in the country. Um, we're in the northern part of Pennsylvania, which is a much shorter growing season, uh, not quite as nice soils as one uh, researcher from Rodale referred to it as the tundra of Pennsylvania. <laughs> so it's a little bit similar growing conditions to what you might think of as uh, Western Massachusetts, Southern New England, uh, probably even parts of the upper Midwest. And just from looking at the map, it's somewhat folded country. It's it's not exactly flat around Trout Run, Pennsylvania. Not no, at all. Not at all. <laughs> um, in fact, Eric spent a fair amount of time out in um, Cashton, Wisconsin area. And he, when we, when we came to this area, he thought it really reminded him of that area. So you can get a visual of that. Yeah, Cashton being, you know, kind of near Lacrosse and and that whole right, driftless region of Wisconsin. And... You guys, I mean, you 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 said how much how many vegetables you're growing and the and the cover crops, but one of the really interesting things I think about Beach Grove Farm is you guys are farming with horses. Yeah, and we've done that uh from the start. Um in some ways I wouldn't say it's the most unusual aspect of our farm. <laughs> uh, and it might almost be considered the least unusual aspect now, but um, I was, it's kind of like the way a lot of us came to organic farming. Uh, the concept completely made sense to us. 
but it wasn't until we got our hands in the soil that we realized how much we loved it. And it was the same for me with horses. I think I had read about it in uh, Wendell Berry's Unsettling of America, the whole sustainability aspects of it, growing your fuel on the farm, the fact they can reproduce themselves, provide fertility uh, for the uh, crops and so on. But it wasn't until I had the opportunity to work on horse farms in Lancaster County that I realized that this is what I love to do and couldn't really imagine uh, farming doing it any other way. And uh, some of that is, you know, farming is so much about uh, working with things that are alive. And so the horses are one more uh, aspect of life. They're right out there in front of you, <laughs> uh, living uh, animate uh, power source. It's always giving you feedback. It's it's almost like, a, well, they're called a team, but it's really like teamwork in a sense. You as a teamster or kind of the coach. And, uh, you know, it's so quiet too. And uh, this is something I really hadn't thought about, but we were uh, part of a research project. It was called the NEON Project, Northeast Organic Network. And it was a multifaceted project, and one part of it was key studies of 12 farms around the Northeast. We were one of them. Uh, researchers came to the farm every two weeks during the growing season for two years, uh, monitoring uh, five different crops. And there were some interesting things that came out of that. Uh, on our farm, uh, they were surprised that horse-drawn cultivation was actually faster than tractor cultivation. That may or may not be a good thing, depending on what you're trying to do. They had determined a nutrient budget for our crops, and it turned out on our farm, it was almost perfectly balanced. We were adding and growing uh, almost the same amount of nitrogen and phosphorus in our fields as we were exporting from the farm and the crops. Uh, they did a nitrogen mineralization study, which showed that the cover crops and a small amount of compost were releasing almost exactly the right amount of nitrogen uh, for a crop of broccoli that we planted in that field. And that crop uh, turned on uh, to yield above the industrial average. But those are all kind of, you know, scientific -y things. And the comment we heard over and over again from the researchers on the farm is it's so quiet on your farm. Everywhere else we go, there's always a tractor running. And I don't know what value you can put on quiet, but it is, a, you might say, a quality of life uh, improvement. <laughs> your farm, because you're farming with horses, is laid out somewhat differently, I think, than, than the typical six-acre intensive market farm. Oh, definitely. And, uh, you know, a big part of that was actually to utilize the horses as much as possible. You know, when we started farming in the early 80s, there really weren't many models for horse-powered market gardens. And the few that were doing it were basically uh, doing the field work, uh, seed prep, uh, bed preparation, and everything after that was handwork. And in fact, a lot of small-scale tractor farms were doing the same thing. But you know, that didn't really provide much work uh, for the horses. And one of the big things that I think is different between the two power sources is that horses require a fair amount of training. And so really the more you use them, the better they get. Well, I think most tractors pretty much know everything they will know when you purchase them. Um, also, you know, you are in a sense fueling the horses year round, they require almost the same amount of feed and care, whether you're working them or not. So the more you use them, uh, the better return you get on their fuel. So one of the things we did right from the start is plant our crops in widely spaced single rows. And this is so we could take advantage of the traditional a uh, straddle row, uh, row crop riding cultivator. And this allows you to uh, cultivate one row at a time. It's what was used traditionally, say with corn, 
tobacco, cabbage, other row crops. Uh, one of the nice features with this cultivator is it has a uh, pedal steering. Uh, so you can actually guide it along the row as you go uh, for precision cultivation. Um, but it does require uh, planting the crops farther apart than what you think of as your typical uh, multiple row plantings in a bed system. Um, we did try experimenting with multiple row beds. And as I said earlier, the horses are maybe the least unusual uh, practice on our farm, we, we also don't use irrigation. We don't even water in the plants. And we are putting out lettuce every week of the growing season, direct seeding, uh, mescaline, and spinach every two weeks. And it's, uh, we really have to pay attention to preserving soil moisture, which is another aspect. But having the crops in widely spaced rows means we're providing a very large reservoir of moisture for each plant. And for that reason, uh, we've stuck with row cropping. We could modify a horse-drawn cultivator to straddle a wider bed and cultivate several rows, but because of trying to dry land market garden, we haven't gone uh, that route. And the other aspect of utilizing the horses as much as possible is, as Ann mentioned earlier, we've divided the market garden uh, into cover crops and vegetable crops. It's actually roughly half acre strips alternating around the market garden. So every other one is in cash crops and the alternating strips are in cover crops. And of course, the cover crops are great for building the soil, reducing the weed seed bank. And it's a great way to use the horses um, you know, throughout the summer, uh, planting the cover crops, mowing the cover crops, incorporating them, and seeding them. Uh, so it's, you know, we're probably tripling the use of the horses uh, as opposed to just seed bed preparation, and that's it. You probably can tell that Eric loves working the horses. The more he gets to do it, the better. It's not like he's trying to get through with a job. Um, this is what gets him up in the morning the more the time he has with the animals, the better. So that's how he's, we've designed this to accommodate that interest. We actually started uh, with both a team of horses and a tractor. And the primary use of the tractor was that Anne had all this tractor driving experience. And it seemed like we should make use of that. And the tractor was great for breaking the old sod, the first plowing on the farm. We were also using it uh, for PTO work, like combining the oats for the horses. So we used a chopper uh, for chopping medicinal herbs before drying them. But I think it was maybe the third or fourth year uh, on the farm, we looked at the tachometer on the tractor and noticed we'd only put seven hours on and we really couldn't justify it. I mean, the maintenance, just changing the oil, whatever <laughs> cost more than uh, the use we were getting from the tractor. And we decided, well, we could just kind of reorganize things on the farm a little bit, drop some crops, uh, buy in the oats for the horses. And uh, so we eventually sold the tractor and did that. What do you use as a power source on the farm when you have jobs that you would have done before with the PTO, and I'm thinking specifically, you know, not so much things that can be done with a soil moving implement because you can trade a plow for a rototiller, but things like a, a chopper, um, you know, something like, you know, you were using to, to, to chop up those medicinal herbs before you were drying them. Well, we no longer grow medicinal herbs and dry them and, and wholesale them. We've done you know, we've scaled back on that. We, we only do fresh herbs anymore. So we don't need that um, equipment anymore. Um, you know, every once in a while you think, oh, it'd be nice to have a chopper to chop up the broccoli stalks or something. But, you know, we, we use uh, manual labor, I guess, for those kinds of jobs. You know, a nice tool found on a lot of vegetable operations is a flail mower or a rotary mower. As Ann mentioned, it's nice for uh, chopping up the crop residue and also comes in very handy with uh, cover crops, you know, chopping them down into a smaller size, easier to manage. 
Uh, we've just found some other ways to handle that. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with a sickle bar mower. That is sort of the traditional horse-drawn uh, implement. Uh, very interesting because you're just using the traction power from the wheels to drive the pitman that runs the sickle bar. And what we do with a tall cover crop, say like rye or oats, is put the cutter bar in transport position. Okay, if you can imagine it's kind of angling up at maybe from 18 inches to 24 inches high. Make a pass with that, that cuts off the top of the cover crop, and we come right back with a cutter bar on the ground, a cut off the bottom half. Now, it's obviously not as small pieces as a brush hog would put it in, but we found it's adequate uh, for getting through with a plow or undercutter or whatever implement we're following it with. So at least you're not ending up with a five or a six foot tall rye stock out there in the exactly. field. Exactly. Well, you know, what I've heard is the maybe the biggest reason people would not switch to horses, and I, I don't think it's a serious obstacle, but it's, it's a very legitimate concern, is that horses don't come with a front end loader. And that would have many uses on a farm, whether it's uh, moving pallets of vegetables into a warehouse or, you know, just uh, moving soil, collecting rocks, whatever. We just simply do things by hand, uh, case by case. It, at our scale, it doesn't seem to be a major problem, but um, it could be a deterrent or it's actually many horse powered farms have a tractor or skid loader just for that purpose. So uh, dual powered farm has its place as well. But that choice to stay at a small scale where you really can do that handwork, that's something that you've been very intentional about. We have been. Um, you know, both of our previous experiences before we got together over 35 years ago, um, mine was on a very large scale farm that um, it just kept expanding and expanding and expanding. And you could see the stress level <laughs> expanding as well. And Eric also saw experiences on different farms where um, just that's, you know, getting to the point where you're at a scale where it's not manageable anymore um, really causes some stress. So we were very, very kind of cognizant of designing our farm that we could work together on a scale that could be manageable and that we would enjoy our work. And we've kept that. And do you guys have hired help on the farm or is it just the two of you? Well, for, I'd say to the first 25 years, it was just the two of us. And then um, we made a decision to have uh, some local people, one person actually um, starting out helping in the packing shed, um, washing, bagging, those kinds of things. And um, so Eric could focus on field work and another person could be here kind of doing the, you know, tedious work, I guess you'd say. And we've been just really, really lucky. Uh, there's a young woman um, who grew up on an organic dairy farm 10 miles from here. She started working here when she was 17 and she just loves working here. Um, this will be her 11th year coming up. Um, and she just, you know, knows every aspect of the farm. She's just great. She's just like a partner in the farm. So she's with us. Um, four years ago, uh, Eric got very, very ill. And for three seasons, um, we had a young man helping us on the farm doing the um, coursework for the summer for three months. But in general, it's, I, I guess you'd say it's a three-person operation now. You know, we started out primarily wholesaling vegetables um, because there wasn't demand in our area. Uh, it was kind of pre-organic, <laughs> at least in these more remote parts of the state. And so we were growing the medicinal herbs that were dried and could be shipped and a lot of root veg vegetables that could also be stored and moved as there was demand. And so that was much easier for the two of us uh, to handle as we transitioned almost completely into direct marketing and doing much more time-consuming crops 
uh, as well as the age factor kicking in, it was very, uh, very helpful to have another pair of hands. You guys have been very intentional about the technologies that you've chosen to employ on the farm. Are you off the grid? No. I mean, we have electricity, you know, we have a telephone. Um, we just chosen not to have a computer. It's not like, um, you know, we're against it or anything like that. I think in general, our personalities, we are pretty minimalist. And we kind of always look at things and say, Do we really need this. Uh, is this necessary? Um, and some things aren't. And we haven't missed it. Um, we haven't had a television since we were married. Um, so, but when we go visit relatives, it's really fun to watch a little television <laughs> Then we can get away from it and don't have a need for it. You know? So when you talk about having a packing shed and, and storing crops, do you guys, do you have a walk-in cooler and, and a, and a regular packing facility with a barrel washer oh, yeah. and other tools like that? We don't have a barrel washer, but we, we have a walk-in cooler. Um, we have a, you know, a, a spinner for the baby greens and, but we, you know, we do a lot of washing by hand with a hose and, you know, we have a whole set of, you know, tubs and tables and things like that. Yes. Just going back to the technology question, um, you know, I'd mentioned I learned to work horses in Lancaster County and both farms I worked on were, uh, old order farms, uh, that, uh, they are not at all uh, anti-technology, but are always looking at how technology affects their community. And so just step back, let's watch and wait and see what happens. And I think uh, that kind of rubbed off on me. So uh, we didn't see the need right away to get on the web or a uh, computer or a smartphone or anything like that. Let's just sort of stand back and watch what happens. Um, it's not going to change anything. I mean, the genie's out of the bottle, right? We're not going to <laughs> uh, stop social media all of a sudden, but uh, I'm not sure everything that's gone along with that has been positive. And in some ways, I think we have a lot more time on our hands. I mean, we're not plugged in all the time. <laughs> we we sit down and read a book, magazine, when we have extra time. And, uh, you know, we've talked to a couple of farmers and say, you know, a computer is a real help, but we spend way more time on the computer than we used to before when we did things by hand. So uh, it's a trade off. Well, and, and of course, we hear that again and again. And it is, a, I mean, it's an incredibly powerful tool. And I know a lot of the listeners. Well, probably the vast majority of the listeners to this show are plugged into technology simply because of the medium here, it being a podcast and something that people do Absolutely. listen to on their phones. But but yeah, mm -hmm. it, it is also certainly something that comes at a cost. And uh, yeah, I mean, even you talk about the quiet that you guys get on the farm, you know, not having that interrupted by an iPhone ringing or not plugging into an audio book while you're working with the horses. Those are... <laughs> You know, those are quality of life choices. Right. And some things happen not necessarily by choice. Like we live in a very hilly area. So um, we don't even have cell phone service here. So we wouldn't even have the option of having, you know, a cell phone on our hip and, and getting phone calls. Um, so that's okay. And we don't, you know, have a problem with that. Yeah, we didn't have cell phone reception on my farm either. And that was always a source of tension with my teenage mm -hmm. children, but it was something that I really did love that you couldn't get a hold of me while I was out on the tractor. Exactly. <laughs> half of the market gardens in vegetables and the other half is in cover crops. Can you tell me a little bit more about how that works and why you've chosen to do that? Well, I think there's several factors to why we, uh, you know, set aside half of the market garden each year for cover cropping. You know, we, some of our decisions have been somewhat arbitrary. So, for example, we decided our only compost input to the market garden would be from the manure generated by our workhorses. Uh, so that is actually a rather limited supply of compost. Uh, typically, over the last 30 plus years, we've had three to four horses. And... You know, we might be producing 
35 to 40 yards of compost uh, maximum. And so we realized that we really needed to uh, have other sources of organic matter to maintain uh, the soil tilth for vegetable production. And of course, the vegetables, most vegetables themselves don't do much for returning organic matter to the soil or even improving aggregation with their relatively wimpy uh, root, root systems. So by taking land out of production, we could grow the cover crops, have plenty of time and space to do it. And this, um, how would you say, compared to growing vegetables year after year, you're always constrained by small windows for cover cropping. You know, maybe you finish up harvest late in the fall, you can get some rye planted, you're ready to turn around, start cropping again in the spring, you turn under the rye again. You really haven't gotten much out of the cover crop. In fact, in some cases, it can be a nuisance. It's just getting in the way of getting going uh, with the cropping year. And I think we realize, particularly in a relatively short growing season like we have here, that we would need to allow the cover crops to grow almost to maturity. In other words, let's really get that right up to where it's heading out and producing a lot of organic matter. And then let's have the time where we could incorporate it and allow it to decompose before planting. So we don't have to concerns with nitrogen tie up or just simply too much coarse organic matter for planting. So typically we would get a overwintering or spring cover crop starting out what we call the fallow year, the year out of production. We could allow this grow until it's almost to maturity. Obviously we don't want it to make a viable seed, incorporate it. Then we have time for what we call a bare fallow period and then plant another significant cover crop uh, for fall growth. And so we're really growing for each cash crop two uh, full uh, mature cover crops. This bare fallow period between the two cover crops is a time when we can intentionally reduce the weed seed bank in the soil. And uh, we do this, it's very similar to what many growers do before planting vegetables, a series of stale seed beds, kind of trick <laughs> the weeds into growing, uh, then uh, shallowly incorporate them so that they're dead and then come back allow another generation of weeds to grow. And, you know, we've been doing this for many years. I, I referred to this uh, NEON project in the early 2000s. Uh, you know, they actually did weed seed counts in our soil and really didn't find much of anything. I mean, they're kind of odd, oddball weeds that you just don't normally find. Uh, most of the weeds were actually cover crop seed. <laughs> so, it, it, you know, and we weren't starting out with high weed pressure. I mean, these were old hay fields. Uh, I think we've seen all of the major weeds, the lamb's quarter, pigweed, gallinstoga, uh, foxtail, and so on. But it wasn't as if it was polluted with these weeds. But uh, we have very intentionally tried to reduce the weed seed bank and it seems to work for us. One of the things you have to keep in mind is that if we reduce the number of weed seeds in the surface of the soil during this bare fallow period, we plant a fall cover crop, and then the next year, if we go in and plow deeply, well, we're gonna end up bringing new weed seeds to the surface, and that's kind of counterproductive. Uh, and that's what really set us uh, down the path of trying to minimize tillage. How could we reduce the depth of tillage so we weren't bringing up new weed seeds to the surface? Uh, this also ties into preserving soil moisture. We're growing kind of on a hilltop. If you till deeply, you get some heavy winds, it's going to almost dry to tillage depth. Not very good when you're trying to seed carrots or uh, spinach or something like that. So a lot of these things have kind of worked together uh, to make the system work. And when you talk about minimizing tillage, you're not necessarily talking about minimizing the number of passes that you make with the tillage, but you're really talking about trying to minimize 
the depth of the soil that you're going after and ha- just how much soil you're disturbing. Is that is that right? Is that my is my understanding? So you, got it, you got it exactly right. I mean, when you think about it, there's a number of ways you can reduce tillage. One of them is, you pointed out, the frequency of tillage. Uh, there's the depth of tillage. There's the intensity of tillage. And I think it would be fair to say that we're not, uh, we are tilling frequently, but not deeply. And it's not intensive tillage. And by this, I mean that you think of a, a rotavator is, feeding the soil at a high RPM. You know, we're just going slowly through the soil, say with a set of sweeps or an undercutter, uh, spring tooth harrow, something like that. But you know, there's there's a lot of interest now in no-till organic vegetable production. And much of it started with, I think, the work at Rodeo and other places where they're rolling down a cover crop and the idea is that the cover crop suppresses the weeds and then you plant into it and you know we've almost come from the opposite end of the spectrum where we first reduce weed pressure and now this gives us the option uh, to do minimum tillage without worrying about the, uh, the weeds you know so we can we no-till garlic into a winter-killed cover crop. Uh, we add a little mulch in the pathways to preserve moisture, but as you know, a winter-killed cover crop breaks down pretty quickly in the spring, and we don't need uh, to weed the garlic. We do minimum till vegetables. Simply, we, we plant the cover crop on a ridge. Again, it's a winter-killed cover crop. In the spring, we go over the ridge tops with a rotary hoe. That's more commonly used for weed control, say, in corn or soybeans, but it's just sort of popping the top inch of the soil, just enough so that we can transplant uh, the bare-rooted onion. You know, so it's, I don't know how workable a process that is for other growers, but it has allowed us a lot of flexibility in terms of reducing tillage. You know, the management uh, that Eric just described has reduced the weeds pressure so low that I don't do any hand weeding at all in the three three and a half acres of vegetables. That's what allows us to be able to um, have only three people here. Um, you know, if you we were fighting weeds all season long, um, it would get very stressful. Uh, that has just really made a big, big difference. In comparison, we do a lot more um, intensive planting what we call um, our house gardens where we have um, six hoop houses. And, you know, regardless of how we manage things, there's always a little bit of more weed pressure in those things. So focusing over the years on the cover crop management and uh, shallow tillage has just made a phenomenal difference in um, our weed pressure. I I think one one other piece of the puzzle is I referred to earlier that we're only using the compost from the, made from the manure produced by our horses. And we can control what we're feeding the horses, the bedding we're using, and the composting process so that we're not introducing new weed seeds to the market garden via the compost. And you know that is such an easy way to increase <laughs> weed seeds is just bringing in that one load of free manure and for years you have a purslane or something like that. So that, you know, it's, it really is a multi-prong uh, process to reduce weed pressure. Are you harvesting your own bedding on the farm for the horses? We originally did. Uh, and I referred to, we had the tractor and we used it for combining oats for the horses. So we use that straw. Um, this is something not only because of uh, no, uh, not being really cost effective to maintain the tractor, but also changed because of getting busier with the market garden crops. Okay, when we, we started out with the storage crops, we had a window during the middle of the summer for making hay, 
harvesting small grains, putting up straw. However, our income from the storage crops sold wholesale uh, was not nearly as good as direct marketing uh, locally. Uh, so the trade-off was, as we went into these more labor-intensive crops, is we gave up harvesting the hay, the grain, and the straw for the horses. This is a real trade-off. Uh, the economics for our farm has worked much better. We are able uh, to buy hay from our immediate uh, farmers, dairy farmers that have extra grass hay. Uh, for many years, we purchased the straw from them as well. Uh, we can drive by their fields and observe how weedy <laughs> the oats look and decide whether we really want to buy straw from that particular farm that year. Um, another development, I guess this is probably in the last eight years, uh, you've probably heard uh, about the uh, natural gas development. We're kind of at the uh, ground zero for fracking for natural gas, something <laughs> we, we haven't really enjoyed being around, but they've had to build all miles and miles of pipelines to move the natural gas out to the big cities. And <clears throat> they mulch all of that pipeline ground with straw. And of course, all the farmers wanted to sell for this because they're getting twice the price that they used to get. Right. And, uh, you know, we literally went from $3 a bale up to 6 or $7 a bale for small bales for oat straw. And so we ended up uh, switching to uh, wood shavings, which of course are completely weed free and uh, have just stuck with that ever since. You're taking that bedding and turning that into compost. Is that correct? Right. And uh, for 25 years, we used uh, pigs to do the composting for us. I don't know if you can visualize this. We have our horses' uh, stalls along one side of the old uh, dairy barn. And then the other side, uh, we constructed three pig pens. Uh, roughly nine by 15 feet and three feet deep. And so we could pitch uh, the bedded horse manure directly into the pig pens. One of the benefits of horse manure is that it generates heat very easily, but that's also its big drawback is it can overheat, basically burn out. You end up with a lot of dry ash, a lot of the nitrogen is going off. You can smell that in the form of ammonia. And uh, we found that by having a couple of good sized pigs on the manure pack, it, uh, in a sense, it reduced the airflow into the manure and slowed down the heat. So we got uh, more moderate temperatures rather than super high temperatures. And then once the manure pack got two to three feet deep, we encouraged the pigs to turn it. We simply poked holes in the manure pack, dribbled corn down the hole. The pigs root their way to the bottom of the hole looking for the corn, turn the manure over in the process. And that was, was without doubt the easiest, <laughs> fastest way uh, to make horse manure compost uh, we've come across. Several things happen. I guess this is again about six to eight years ago, uh, we were growing the pigs for a soup kitchen in new, nearby Williamsport. And this older gentleman who has always butchered the pigs uh, was finally getting old enough. He said, I, I don't, can't do this anymore. Uh, we had, didn't quickly find someone else who was willing to butcher the pigs on a volunteer basis. Uh, we were feeding the pigs organic corn because we didn't want to import GMOs onto the farm. Uh, right at that time, the price of organic corn uh, doubled. Um, I'm not saying the farmers didn't uh, deserve it, but it got a little pricey for uh, growing uh, pork that we were going to donate. And then we also tried an experiment. I guess you'd have to think we were crazy to even consider it, but of 
collecting all of the manure the horses dropped on pasture, bringing it in uh, to the pig pens for composting. <laughs> I won't go into the details of that unless you're, you're really interested, but it did mean that we needed more bedding to offset the manure, and that was going to be an added expense uh, to do it with pigs. And so we've, uh, in a sense, transitioned into more of a low-till composting system. Um, we've noticed that a lot of composting systems, they actually segregate the solid manure from the liquids. There are a number of reasons for doing that, but we realized once you did that, uh, it really dropped the temperature, the ammonia production, kept things, everything uh, more moderate. So we kind of have two streams where the urine-soaked bedding goes out to a hoop house, kind of gets pre-composted, loops back into the horse stalls as bedding, gets more urine, goes back out, then every day a small percentage of that pre-composted litter with the manure solids go into the composting uh, pens that are adjacent. We just have a flock of uh, laying hens on top of it to kind of mix it and scratch it. Uh, the temperatures rarely get over 130 degrees. Um, makes a very nice horse manure compost. This obviously isn't uh, meeting the standards either for the NOP or for uh, food safety. So we have to treat the compost as if it's raw manure, uh, applying it 120 days before the harvest of most of our crops. Uh, a small percentage of this we put into a tumbler we built that qualifies as in-vessel composting. So you only need to reach a temperature over 131 for three days in a row. Uh, we actually get temperatures well over that for about a three-week period. We actually roll this tumbler kind of like a big drum across our barn floor. Uh, we use this compost for our potting mix and in the high tunnels where we have a quick turnover of the vegetables. And then the compost that you're applying out in the fields, are you applying that on the vegetable portion or is that going on to the cover crops? Uh, well, as I said, it, it always goes on, uh, you know, three to four months ahead of the harvest of the vegetables. Um, I would say in general, for any uh, early planted vegetables, the compost is going on the year before. We would typically apply it during that air fallow period uh, and before planting the fall cover crop, we'd be using a winter killed cover crop in that case. So it's easy to do minimum depth tillage in the spring. Before say fall vegetables, uh, sometimes we're applying the compost into the spring onto an overwintering cover crop, say like rye and hairy vetch or a mix of clovers. With the rotation that you're following, this this one year of cover crops and bare fallow, and then one year of vegetables, is that something that you started with, or was that something that you developed as the farm developed and matured? We basically design, designed it in that way right from the start. Um, I think we were influenced by both of our previous experiences um, but also by our neighbors uh, who had very good rotations of um, corn, oats, hay. Um, and so we could always, you know, we're always looking at how other farmers do their jobs. And we were trying to kind of implement those concepts within um, the vegetables. I had farmed out in the uh, state of Washington in Trout Lake, and um, it was that's the way their farm was also designed. So we're just very influenced by our previous experiences, as we probably all are. You know, in, in Trout Lake, Washington, it was a medicinal herb farm, and it was, you know, really essential to have low weed pressure before planting these low-growing crops that had to be, you know, contaminant-free before they were dried and shipped for medicinal uses. And they used this cover crop, 
fallow sequence in preparation for these herbs, most of which were perennials, would stay in the ground then for several years. Um, so we did that right from the start because uh, we knew that the hay fields that were here on the farm were completely infested with quack grass, and it would just be hopeless to plant vegetables directly into that. Uh, so we use actually very extended bare fallow to clean up the quack grass and then planted the vegetables the next year. And, you know, some of that area, we planted the vegetables again the following year. And what we noticed is that beautiful, loamy, crumbly soil that we had coming out of sod by the end of two years of cultivated vegetables was silty and crusting <laughs> and really not much fun to work with. And I think that's when the light bulb went on that, you know, unless we're going to import a lot of compost uh, to radically improve the stable organic matter in the soil, we would need to keep reconditioning it with the root system of cover crops. And we basically did that ever since, uh, always taking land out of production uh, to grow cover crops before planting uh, the vegetables. How long did it take you using the cover crop and bare fallow rotation sequence to feel like you had the weed seed bank under control on your farm? <laughs> and it's, it's a little hard to say, but, you know, about, I think it was a, about the time we started farming, uh, Elliot uh, Coleman's wonderful book, The New Organic Grower, came out. And we were really intrigued with his use of overseeding the vegetables with clover. And uh, we tried that. We got a nice clover stand, but we also had a lot of weeds growing in the clover. And it just wasn't practical to spend our time weeding the clover, let alone weeding the cash crop. And so that was a pretty good indication that initially we weren't there yet. But I would say about four years. In other words, we think of it as a four-year rotation, uh, typically late planted vegetables, a year of fallow year of cover crops, early planted vegetables, a fallow year of cover crops. By the end of that four-year sequence, a dramatic reduction in weed pressure uh, we started uh, interseeding the vegetables after that point. Uh, typically, we use just an, a single row of hairy vetch planted in the middle of the pathways. Uh, this is also because we're not irrigating. We found the broadcast seeding of clover uh, could become quite moisture competitive with a cash crop. Also somewhat hard to manage if it grew tall and started reducing air circulation where the single row of vetch just kind of creates a mat on the uh, floor of the soil. So I would say for, depending on the field, four to six years, we could start implementing that practice. Uh, we didn't begin uh, no tilling or sort of minimum tilling until I'd say 12 years. In other words, three times uh, through the four year rotation. And when you say didn't start no tilling or minimum tilling, what does that no till or minimum till look like compared to the practices that you had during the first 12 years? Well, I would say the initial 12 years, um, if we had a winter till cover crop, we were typically going over that in the spring with a disc. Okay, this is a small horse-drawn disc with some weight on it. We were probably only tilling two to three inches deep. It was enough to incorporate some of the residue, uh, loosen it enough for planting. Uh, typically, our cultivator is set up with large tractor sweeps, so we can handle a lot of residue as far as that goes, but uh, we couldn't just go in and no-till uh, efficiently transplanting and certainly not uh, direct seeding with, a, say, a Planet Junior or Earthway. 
Um, for an overwintering cover crop, we were typically uh, plowing as shallow as we could. We found with the horses and walking plow, we could often get down to just two inches deep, say with a cover crop of overwintering rye. Uh, clover is a little trickier, often more like three to four inches deep. If we were letting the rye and vetch, say, go to flowering, then again, we would often uh, knock that down with a disc. Um, or I've referred to at different times an undercutter. This is simply uh, one shank mounted in the middle of the riding cultivator, which has a 12 inch sweep on it that kind of undercuts uh, the cover crop. And on top of the sweep, uh, we call it a, a potato furrower. I don't know if you can imagine it'd be like a big shovel you'd use for opening a furrow for planting potatoes. Uh, it acts kind of like ridging wings. So as the sweep undercuts the cover crop, it throws a little bit of soil on top of it. And then we could allow that to decompose a little bit, level the field uh, with a spring tooth harrow. We have our harrow set up with widely spaced teeth so it can handle the residue, uh, then typically uh, level the field with either a cultipacker or rotary hoe. Uh, so depending on which <laughs> uh, sequence I described to you, it's either a clean seed bed, like after shallow plowing, or what you might refer to as mulch tilling with the shallow uh, tillage of the cover crops on the surface. Uh, by contrast, uh, no tilling, uh, we're simply cutting a slit through the cover crop residue. Again, we're using the riding cultivator uh, with a uh, coulter mounted in the front and a narrow tooth in the back. And then we can come back. And in the case of garlic, we're hand setting the clothes or transplants, we're sticking that into that planting furrow uh, by hand. You know, we've never scaled up to using a transplanter. You know, there are all sorts of transplanters now made for using uh, with horses. Um, but again, we're, we're rarely planting enough of any one thing to justify it. Uh, typically a transplanter, at least planting at a horse's pace, which is around uh, three miles an hour, you need three people, you know, one to drive the team and two on the transplanter. A little hard to do with just two of us. And then we also found it, uh, it allows us to plant into much higher residue than would be possible uh, with most uh, mechanical transplanters. With that, we're going to stop here. We're going to take a quick break and get a word from a couple of sponsors. And then we'll be right back with Ann and Eric Nordell from Beach Grove Farm in Trout Run, Pennsylvania. Perennial support for the Farmer to Farmer podcast is provided by Vermont Compost Company, makers of Fort V and Fort Light potting mixes. What if you didn't have to worry about weak transplants and poor germination due to less than great potting soil, or getting truly finished compost for your homemade blend, or making sure your employees remember to add the fertilizer charge? Been there, done that. And what if your potting soil was packed full of the fungal biology you want and none of the weed seed biology you don't? What if you could go trip? transplants up until the roots filled the container without having to worry about supplying extra fertility? And what if your potting soil had your back consistently year after year? That's what Vermont Compost Potting Soil can bring to you, taking care of growers by taking care of transplants since 1992. VermontCompost.com. The podcast is also brought to you by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are real farming equipment for real farmers. And with PTO-driven attachments like rototillers, flail mowers, rotary plows, power harrows, log splitters, snow throwers, even a utility trailer and a new water transfer pump, you've got the tools you need to get jobs done across the farm and the homestead. On my own farm, we went through a number of so-called solutions for mowing and tilling before we finally got smart and bought a BCS. Even though we owned a four-wheel tractor to manage our 20 acres of vegetables, that BCS tackled jobs that we simply couldn't do with the larger machine, from mowing steep slopes and around trees to working in our high tunnels. Plus, they're gear-driven for years of dependable service. Check out bcsamerica.com to see the full lineup of tractors and attachments, plus videos of BCS in action. 
All right, and we're back with Ann and Eric Nordell from Beach Grove Farm in Trout Run, Pennsylvania. So, I mean, it's easy talking to you guys to get focused on the horses and the and the cover crops and the weed control aspect out in the field. Now, clearly, the weed control aspect out in the field. And you mentioned that that uh, that you haven't done any of the hand weeding. I thought that was an interesting comment earlier because it it really did sound like you've got a division of labor on the farm there. Well, yes, we do have a division of labor, but it's not like Eric's out weeding. No, nobody's out there weeding. Um, so in that re- realm, um, we've kind of solved the problems of having excessive weed pressure. That's that's what I meant earlier. But yes, there is, uh, it's developed organically kind of a division of labor in that Eric really focuses on soils and cover crops and tillage. And my real love is plants. And so I do all of the seeding in the greenhouses. Um, you know, I'm the one who decides which crops are going to be grown when we're transplanting. Um, I and my the other woman who helps me, you know, we do all of the harvesting and um, the work in the packing shed, as well as um, I do all the marketing. Um, we do one farmer's market a week, um, and I hire five other people. And they're all friends, and we just had this very good market. And then on Wednesdays, I do deliveries to uh, restaurants. So, and Eric doesn't have to do any marketing. So those things, you know, if just there's a real division about who's responsible for certain aspects of running a farm. Now, in the greenhouse, you talked about doing the transplant production. I think you guys have an interesting greenhouse setup. Can you describe how that works on your farm? Yes, we do. Um, it's a fairly small structure, but it's designed with bottom heat. So there is a uh, a barrel stove with a chimney running the length of the greenhouse and then a chimney out the back. And on top of that chimney, there is a uh, grate. And we've put um, about 18 inches of stone on top of the grate. And the whole idea is we run a very... A uh, short hot fire initially about six o'clock at night through the system and it heats up the stones so that the the plants are getting a lot of bottom heat but not a lot of excess heat in the whole um, structure itself so overnight the air temperature could be 55 degrees but the soil temperature stays about 70 and it's worked very well so far how big of a greenhouse are you heating with that system Oh, maybe, I don't know, yeah, 12 by 16. Okay. And then we have another greenhouse that is unheated. So we're actually maybe not the most efficient, but we do move as the plants get bigger. We move them into another hoop house before they're transplanted out. Well, and most efficient or less efficient, I mean, maybe less efficient in terms of labor, but more efficient in terms of the heating resources that you're using. Oh, yeah. We use... Probably, I don't know, a quarter of a quart of firewood all season long to heat the greenhouse. I mean, it's very, it's a very small amount. And are you starting all of your own plants in there? When you talk about transplanting onions and you talk about a quarter of a quart of firewood, is that include yeah. seeding onions at this time? And, you know, here at the end of February, early March? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Wow. Yeah. We also do, I must say, um, we have an enclosed uh, glass porch off of our of the south side of our house that um, we do initially start our you know our onions and the earliest crops out there. Uh, we have a source of heat from our we have a, a wood furnace in, in the house and that pumps out heat into the front porch. So you know I can have maybe forty fifty flats out on that front porch before it goes out to the other greenhouse. When you're managing the harvest process, are you using the horses to get crops out of the field or is that something where you're moving things back up to the packing shed by hand? Uh, we use a pickup truck. Oh, okay. Um, we, you know, we're taking everything out of the field by hand, but we have a pickup truck on the edges of the field. And, um, you know, we're harvesting really, really early in the morning you know, we're doing a lot of greens and, you know, maybe I'm impatient, but I like to get up there fast instead of, you know, having to bring the horses in, feed them, harness them, take them up. Um, so 
life's a compromise, but I love my pickup truck. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, we didn't start doing it for this reason, but of course, uh, you know, food safety is becoming a bigger and bigger concern and having work animals in a crop that you're harvesting isn't really an ideal situation. So by using the pickup truck, uh, you know, we kind of take that out of the equation. Um, Maybe some of your listeners are not aware of it, but, you know, there are thousands of acres of uh, produce being grown now by the old order Amish and Mennonite communities. Uh, It's kind of saved many of those communities as dairy farming has become so difficult and they're using all of what you would think of typical market garden implements, you know, plastic mulch layers, water wheel planters, uh, mulch lifters. And most of those farms are designed so that there is a drive lane. You know, maybe there's eight, 10 beds of uh, vegetables and then a drive lane planted to a cover crop or a perennial grass. And that's where the team and wagon, sometimes using a boom conveyor, uh, goes through so they aren't actually taking the horses into the field. And, Anne, when you said you're, you're parking the truck at the edge of the field, do you guys have lanes between these, these 60 foot wide blocks of produce and cover crops? No, um, it, it just goes around the perimeter of the market garden. So, mm-hmm. Um, the, the half acre strips are 380 feet long. So say we're harvesting, you know, we'll, we'll harvest half that field length at one end and then we'll move the truck around to the other end. So we're, we're only walking in and out, whatever that is, 180 feet or something. So we don't have the pickup truck going through. And I'm just curious, is there a reason that you guys haven't implemented a harvest lane system? Oh, I don't know. Um, I guess just we have to change. We're not good yeah. at that. <laughs> okay, that, that's well, good enough for I me. I think one thing we've noticed is we have, uh, you know, dramatically reduced the weed pressure in the fields. Where we see weeds are encroaching from the edges, okay, whether it's a quackgrass rhizome or the implement or on our boots, we're, you know, walking through uh, weed seeds and the wet dew and then bringing them into the field. So you can very clearly see that, you know, it's the first 20 feet. If you're going to have to do any weeding, that's where it will be. So if we started implementing, uh, you know, permanent lanes, it's just going to create that many more edges. And so again, it's kind of a trade off between efficiency of weed management versus efficiency of harvest. And I don't know, you know, it's kind of interesting. So many growers we know are focused on reducing the number of steps they take. And of course, that's a great thing. But we always found it was really good for our bodies to get up and walk. (laughs) You know, if all you're doing is in a stoop position and then right uh, to the vehicle, uh, you can get a sore back much faster that way. We've had Ben Hartman who who wrote the book, The Lean Farm, on the podcast Mm -hmm. quite a while back. And he talked about, and I've seen a lot of conversation recently about um, this concept of muda, which is is waste in a lean system. And and it's interesting what you're saying there, Eric, because it's, you know, you could look at at the Beach Grove Farm system and say, there's a lot of waste. There's a lot of time feeding the horses. There's a lot of monkey business with making your own compost rather than just buying it in. There's this, like you just said, there's picking up, you know, harvesting a a case of lettuce and then standing up and walking it to the end of the field. It seems (laughs) like you guys don't look at that as waste, though. That's actually part of the system. Exactly. Um, You know, you have to sustain yourself um, in order to do this. You know, um, we could have easily designed some, you know, amazingly efficient system and we would uh, be able to expand and we'd have, you know, all kinds of things going on and we'd probably not be having fun anymore and enjoying ourselves. And 
we've just been very, very conscious of that. And that, I mean, the concept of time is money, yes, but also um, this is our life. <laughs> um, it's not just our work. Um, and we're just, we're not always trying to get things done as fast as possible so that we can move on to the next project. It's, um, you know, when you stand up, you're harvesting lettuce and you stand up and you walk out to the pickup truck, you're actually seeing, you know, beautiful mountains around you. I mean, it sounds kind of, you know, hokey, but you actually get up and, and walk around instead of just having your head down. You know, we actually uh, picked up Ben Hartman's second uh, book at the PASA conference this weekend. And it's it, great. Is, it is just a phenomenally well-written book, uh, incredible visuals, all his crops look great. And I was just, you know, I was struck by the same thing as you, Chris, that in some ways, uh, we are both trying to cut waste out of our systems. We've just done it very different ways. <laughs> you know, he went away from the cover cropping to using large amounts of compost. We're making very small amounts of compost and doing lots of cover crops. Some ways, I think it's uh, it's the same goal, just different uh, paths to get there. And but I, I put look at a lot of the pictures of Ben and his employees harvesting. And they're always bending. They're always, you know, if you, their bodies aren't upright or straight down, they're always to the side. That twisting that can ergonomically may not be the best over the years, where you have a single row of salad mix. I know it sounds crazy, but you can straddle that row. You can cut it very quickly, and uh, you know it's, they, uh, it's good for air circulation, and other things like that. But it's, it's different aspects of lean, maybe. <laughs> In fact, we spoke out at the uh, Mid-Ohio uh, Vegetable Growers Conference last winter, and uh, one of the farmers from the Pioneer uh, Manufacturing Company, they make horse-drawn equipment. They've implemented the lean system, and one of them came up to me and said, have you heard of this Ben Hartman? And you know, some of the things you're doing just really look like lean, and we haven't even heard of the concept at the time, but uh, we're glad we made the grade. You know? And I just think it's interesting because it shows that there's a lot of different ways to, to think about lean or to think about even that, that concept, again, of, of waste. And, and it's not just that it has to lead to one particular farming system. Absolutely. You know, um, our system of the every other year cover crop, cash crop thing, we were able to do this because we bought land that was relatively cheap and we could afford to do that. And that allowed us to do this so that we could become, in a sense, more efficient with our, our harvesting and planting so that we aren't spending all of our time weeding. That, you know, that's our basic concept where we totally understand people that are in um, areas where land is extremely expensive, they have to really, you know, do things on a much more concentrated uh, area, and they have different methods, and there's no one right way. Um, so it's just the way we've kind of looked at our environment here. You know, the, the length of the field is more efficient to work with horses, you know, uh, a 50 foot bed, we would be turning all the time. And that is at the end of the rows, come back into the next row. And that is slow going with a team of horses and requires a fair amount of room. Uh, you know, and again, it's a, uh, what your experience is. When I was out in the state of Washington, we had rows that were half mile long. So 380 feet doesn't seem that long to me. <laughs> and 50 feet seems really short, you know? so it, it is really all relative. I remember one of the first farms that I worked on, Harmony Valley Farm in Wisconsin, getting dropped off in the morning at one end of the row of zucchini and, and being you know, told by the farmer, I'll be back in three hours to pick you up. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hmm. I mean, interesting that you mentioned the, the ergonomics of the harvest. and. I mean, Ann, when you're harvesting lettuce, are you you're straddling that row and, and just going down and, and cutting those lettuces while you're while you're basically on top of that? Right, right. 
so I'm not to the side at all. So my, um, you know, my waist isn't twisted. So I'm, I'm right over it. So I can harvest, you know, 25 pounds of mescaline in about 20 minutes, you know, so it just goes zoom, 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 you know, or, or heads of lettuce. It goes really fast. You just, and, and with the mescaline, when you're talking about a single row of mescaline, is I mean, is it really just a single row, or is this like a four or six inch <laughs> wide band? It is. It's it's direct seeded, pretty heavy, so it is maybe it would be considered a wide band, but it's certainly not six rows to a bed. Um, and so it is just a you know a, a, a thick seeding of. Uh, of, of le- mixed, you know, lettuces that, um, you know, we, we harvest them maybe a little taller than some people do. It might be four or five inches tall. Um, but yeah, it works for us. Are you willing to share the economics of your farming system? I mean, can, can you tell us like what kind of gross sales you're getting and, and how much of that you guys are hanging on to in a year? Mm-hmm. We average about 85,000 a year. And our costs usually are about, our farm costs are usually about 40,000. No, you know, that's as if we're reporting to IRS looking for every cost we can. (laughs) Right, right. And of course, when we talk about farm profits, there's a a huge variability in in that, right? In what you report to the IRS and what you keep. But it's always interesting to get at least some sort of an idea. I mean, you know, eighty five thousand dollars off of three and a quarter acres of vegetables is certainly nothing to sneeze at. Right, and 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 one I think big difference also between our farm and many other small scale market gardeners is that due to our location in the mountains, where we have a relatively cool short growing season, and our market in Williamsport is down along the river, it's almost two growing zones warmer is that the growers down there are going to be so much earlier than us with warm season crops, you know, tomatoes, peppers, and melons. So our niche has really been the cool season crops, the leafy greens and root crops. So where a typical market garden might gross a third of their income on tomatoes, for us, it's I don't know if it's even 5%. It's a very small percentage, just a few rows in our high tunnels. Um, so we're, not only are we uh, grossing that on widely spaced rows, but not the highest value crops either. You know, one of the things that, that I feel like has really changed in farming over the last 20 years. And I, I always, you know, when I say stuff like this, I always feel like I'm acting like an old timer, which I'm not really an old timer, <laughs> but, but it, it does seem like the weather has gotten a little bit nuttier in the last 20 years, more heavy rainfalls, more extended drought periods. And you mentioned that you guys aren't using irrigation. How have you guys adapted to this changing weather over the last 30 some odd years of farming? Well, you know, we actually are growing a lot of our own, we're mulching um, a lot of our crops now. Um, with that in mind, we have seen, you know, some real temperature variations um, and we're growing our own mulch uh, in like a, for example, it could be in one of our fallow areas where we have um, a cover crop of rye. We're letting that rye get fairly mature and mowing it, raking it, and then moving that mulch over into um, our onions. So the, the onions have that moisture all season long um, and, and keeps the soil cooler. And, you know, um, we, we're always kind of trying to uh, minimize uh, moisture loss. So we're doing that whole thing that Eric was describing earlier about shallow tillage. And, you know, it really is amazing we transplant every single week without any irrigation at all. Um, lettuce and, you know, in the middle of the summer, we're, we're transplanting our fall broccoli. Um, and there's always enough moisture for get, to get those crops off to a good start. So I hear a lot of things on the, on the podcast where I go like, really? Is that, can I, can I believe that? Cause that, 
that seems absolutely contrary to my experience as a market farmer. Well, I mean, there are days when I also go, I can't believe there's actually really good soil moisture here because it's been, you know, hot for 10 days and, you know, uh, we haven't had a drop of rain. But I think it's this whole idea of um, creating a dust mulch um, in the soil so that you've got the capillary action. The capillary action comes up to the level of that dust mulch and the dust mulch, it acts as a barrier to for moisture to evaporate and you know that's what we've done all these years and it really works with that we're going to turn here to our lightning round but first we're going to get a quick word from one more sponsor this lightning round and the podcast in general is brought to you by high mowing organic seeds when your livelihood depends on the quality of your seeds be confident in your investment when you grow organically you need to know that your seeds were selected to perform in organic conditions high mowing Organic Seeds offers professional quality seeds grown by organic farmers for organic farmers. Visit High Mowing online to request a free copy of their 2018 seed catalog, read about the company's mission, and browse over 700 organic varieties including tried and true market standards, all new high performance hybrids, and beloved heirlooms. Use the code F2FSEEDS, that's F, the number two, F seeds when you purchase online or mention that code when you call to receive a 10% discount on purchases of $100 or more. Visit highmowingseeds.com slash farmer to farmer or call 866-735-4454 to get started. Eric, what's your favorite tool on the farm? I'd have to say my favorite tool, and I've already referred to it a few times, is the uh, riding cultivator. Um, it's just such a flexible tool, uh, so much fun to use with the horses. And uh, we found so many different ways of uh, using it. Um, we've actually initiated uh, several surveys of Teamsters, horse-powered market gardeners, to try to develop some benchmark numbers. Uh, you know, that's uh, they're rare enough just for vegetable production, but there's really nothing been done out there for uh, farming with horses, growing vegetables. And uh, one of the things we did was track all of the hours we spent for each implement used on the farm. And uh, I was surprised to realize I spend half of my time on field work on that riding cultivator but only a handful of those hours were actually devoted to cultivating for weed control, okay? Most of the cultivating we're doing is for moisture control, uh, just like Ann said, trying to preserve a earth mulch uh, to slow down evaporation. Uh, we use the cultivator for forming planting beds, uh, for doing uh, the min minimum tillage uh, for marking planting furrows. Uh, so I guess it's, I'm glad it's my favorite tool because I spend an awful lot of time on it. <laughs> he has four of them. Nice. Four cultivators. <laughs> yeah, the fleet. So, and he's managed to adapt those cultivators to, you know, things that aren't traditionally used. So, um, you know, he's always looking in these different magazines and catalogs about, you know, new tillage techniques that larger farmers are doing. And then he kind of adapts that to this small implement. So he's not having to change all of those things. Um, you know, just using one cultivator, he'd be constantly changing shanks and things like that. But so, so having four makes it a lot easier. And what's your favorite crop to grow? I love lettuce. Uh, you know, we grow, I don't know, five or six different varieties of lettuce uh, for just for heads. And then we probably seed, I don't know, six, eight different varieties for the masculine mix. Um, so I think lettuce is probably my favorite. And we eat salad every day. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, it has to be it. Is there one variety that stands out in your mind? Well, for a bib lettuce, for years we've grown a variety called Hermosa which you can only get from one tea company. I think it's Turtle Tree Seeds. It used to be available, you know, through other um, companies, but no longer. 
Um, that is a beautiful bib. And then also there is a romaine called Kalura, also from the same company, that um, is a, just a lovely, uh, it's big, it has great flavor, um, seems to hold up in weather variations. Those two are probably my favorite. Eric, what's Anne's farming superpower? <laughs> well, it's interesting you uh, use the term superpower because I always refer to Anne as Super Anne. And she, is, she has many superpowers. She seems to be just able to do anything well from uh, planting to seeding, harvesting. Uh, even though we don't have more than one employee at this point, she seems to know how to handle people so well. Uh, crowds at the farmer's market, uh, as president of the farmer's market board, you know, sometimes working with farmers is like herding cats, and she's a great cat herder. <laughs> and, um, a lot of people just seem to love to talk to her. She calls it therapy. Um, and then, as Ann mentioned, uh, after being hospitalized for a month four years ago and a long, slow uh, recovery uh, period, uh, she was really uh, carrying the full load here and just doing it without any problems. So, uh, so I consider Super Ann is the secret weapon of our farm. And how did you and Eric decide to farm together? <laughs> well, both of us. Uh, were on different farms. So I think both of us had farming in our blood at that point in our lives. And um, maybe I should tell you briefly how we met is that um, I was a crew boss uh, working on this uh, organic herb farm for six years. And Eric was traveling the off, um, across the country uh, working on different farms. And he uh, called up and asked if he could um, work for a week or two on this herb farm. And so I hired him. So I was his boss. And um, I guess I got a sense of his work ethic. <laughs> and uh, anyway, it all just evolved from that. So I think when we've just, you know, right away when we got together, we, we realized that we wanted to farm together. And then before we get to our last question in the lightning round, you guys have a book, Weed the Soil, Not the Crop. And mm -hmm. how do people go about getting that? Uh, they can um, uh, write to us. And um, it's, it's a cost of $10 with uh, $3 shipping. And, you know, send a check and we will mail it out to them. There's also a, uh, a DVD of a workshop that we did actually out at the Moses Conference a number of years ago um, that we also put together so people can get a kind of visual of what uh, our farm system is like. And what's the cost on the DVD? Uh, that's $15 plus $3 shipping. You know, we do this just as an educational thing. It's not like we're making a lot of money off this. Uh, you know, it's just to kind of share information. Right. The book is, it, it's a booklet of a series of articles that uh, Eric has written over the years uh, for the publication, The Small Farmer's Journal. And the address that people would send a check to? Uh, it would be Ann and Eric Nordell, 3410 State Route 184, Trout Run, Pennsylvania, one seven. And we will also put that address on the show notes page for this episode. So if you're out driving the tractor and didn't get that written down, you can go back and check for that later. Or I shouldn't say driving the tractor. I should say if you're out <laughs> behind the team of horses. Um, all right. So, so finally, and if you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing, what would it be? Uh, pace yourself. You don't have to get everything done in the first two years. Um, you know, look about the long haul um, and think about, okay, is this still going to be fun after 30 years, 35 years? I think that's what I would say. And Eric, same question for you. If you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing, what would it be? Oh, get a crystal ball. <laughs> 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 you know, um, I think location is such 
a critical thing for a successful farm. And we located here because the land was inexpensive and we liked the area. Uh, but there wasn't a large urban progressive market in the area. We were uh, relying on Anne's expertise with growing medicinal herbs, which we could dry and ship out of the area. Um, we're very fortunate that we've been able uh, to develop uh, a fresh market that's uh, direct marketing that has worked for us. Um, but I, I remember you know, talking about advice. I remember this uh, man who was kind of a mentor to me, uh, Dick Bliss, uh, after we were married and explained that we wanted to start farming. And he said, you should make sure to locate somewhere where you have kindred spirits. And we thought that was good advice, but it seemed like where all the interesting people were located, <laughs> the land was very expensive. And where we could afford to start farming um, was, you know, a very rural area. And both of us, because we love farming and associating with farmers, that didn't seem to deter us from locating here. But the reason I say I have a crystal ball is we would never have realized that this would have changed from an area that uh, was small family dairy farms to large pig and chicken CAFOs uh, where fracking natural gas would be taking place. You know, in, in a sense, we almost feel a little bit alienated from <laughs> the area we settled in. And, you know, that can happen anywhere. Uh, and so where we felt uh, we had kindred spirits in the sense of a lot of farmer friends, they were not growing organic vegetables, but there was a lot else we had in common. Uh, now we feel like there's a lot fewer people we have in common. And it's almost hard thinking about down the road when uh, we really scale back on farming, uh, where our social life will be at that time when, uh, you know, all of our satisfaction isn't coming from the farming itself. That might be a little too heavy. <laughs> that's okay. Some, sometimes it is heavy, right? I mean, that's, right. that's just the reality. Ann and Eric, thank you so much for being part of the Farmer to Farmer podcast today. Well, thank you, Chris. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so wrapping things up here, I'll say again that this is episode 159 of the Farmer to Farmer podcast. You can find the notes for this show at farmertofarmerpodcast.com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for Nordell. That's N-O-R-D-E-L-L. -L. The transcript for this episode is brought to you by Earth Tools, offering the most complete selection of walk-behind farming equipment and high-quality garden tools in North America, and by Osborne Quality Seeds, a dedicated partner for growers. Visit osborneseed.com for high-quality seed, industry-leading customer service, and fast order fulfillment. Additional funding for transcripts is provided by North Central SARE, providing grants and education to advance innovations in sustainable agriculture. Remember that you can get the show notes for every Farmer to Farmer podcast right in your email inbox by signing up for my newsletter at farmertofarmerpodcast.com. Also, if you like the show, please head on over to iTunes, leave us a review, talk to us in the show notes, tell your friends on Facebook, we're at Purple Pitchfork on Facebook. And hey, you know, those codes that we give out, like the F2F seeds for high mowing seeds, for our sponsors to be able to track how many people are listening and enjoying the show. And the same thing goes when you talk to our sponsors, the ones that don't do a discount code, make sure you tell them that you appreciate their support of a resource you value. Now, you can also support the show directly by going to farmertofarmerpodcast.com slash donate. I am working to make the best farming podcast in the world, and you can help. Finally, please let me know who you would like to hear from on the show through the suggestions form at farmertofarmerpodcast.com, and I will do my best to get them on the show. Thank you for listening. Be safe out there, and keep the tractor running. <laughs>